Hi everybody, welcome to our uh, last session for the day at the Wool Museum. Uh, we have Andy Grover here from Red Hat all the way over from Portland and uh, his talk is Melvin, a new implementation of LVM in Rust. Uh, and there's a subtitle that we weren't aware of so uh, I'll let you talk about that right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me here at LCA this year. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. This is not the talk that when I submitted it low that eight or seven months ago that I thought I was going to be giving. But I think this is actually a better and more interesting talk than the talk I would have given. So uh, I, I hope you agree. So since that talk, Melvin, the project written in Rust that I was going to talk about has become defunct, but it has had a child before it became defunct. So I'll also be talking about its child for you. So, but still talking about Melvin, but more in, a, in the, the things we learned, learned kind of sense, rather than this is something awesome that I expect you all to go use. So this is a, a pretty technical audience. So I'm assuming that most, if not all of you, have know what LVM is. Um, have probably used LVM or had it had your installer configure it for you, but just to uh, to just kind of go over some of the terminology that LVM uses and that we'll be getting into more about later in the talk. So LVM is a way to provide a little bit of abstraction over your disks or your disk partitions. So down here at the bottom, um, the blue boxes are meant to represent like hard disks, and instead of partitioning those just with normal partitions, instead you can give them to LVM, they become physical volumes and they, they get grouped in something called a volume group. And then from that volume group, you can create logical volumes and these logical volumes are better than the volumes that you could, could have created on the disks themselves. You can expand them more flexibly, you can make them redundant so you can lose a disk and you're still okay. Um, there's, there's a variety of different things that LVM lets you do that makes, the L, makes a logical volume better than just the straight volume off the disk. So LVM really consists of three, th three major pieces of functionality to make this happen. One is that, uh, one is that it has to interact with the Linux kernel's uh, device mapper subsystem. That's the real engine behind uh, the real way that you can take, it lets you map some disks and then create more disks on top that have more interesting capabilities. So that's the real thing that's doing all the work. It's, in the, it's this kernel code. So that's the first thing that it has to do is kind of tell device mapper what to do. The second thing that it has to do is it has to, the, your, your LVM configuration needs to be persistent across, across boots. So that has to be stored someplace. The way that LVM stores it is that each of these physical volumes, there is a PV label and a PV metadata area, and it gets stored in each individual disk. What that means is that if, if you come up and you only had two of these disks, it's still going to be able to get to that metadata and find it and uh, hopefully, hopefully bring, bring up the volume group and bring up the logical volumes. So configure device mapper, read and write the metadata. The third thing it needs to do is it needs to handle the command line, parsing the command, the, the command line that uh, the user or a program constructs to tell LVM what to do. Um, it has to parse the command line and, and, and say whether that's a good thing to do or whether to disallow that. So that's not, and this has become actually a significant piece of what the LVM code does. As LVM has matured over the years, the number of different kinds of logical volumes has grown. And so with that, the command line interface has had to become more sophisticated to tell it to do these different things. And kind of a, there, there was kind of a combinatorial explosion of the different things that you can pass for a given command line arguments. And, and so that's, a, that's actually a large a part of what LVM a large chunk of the LVM code. So on top of this kind of basic structure, um, uh, like I said before, there's, there's high availability, there's um, using SSDs as a cache for slower, slower uh, spinning Rust drives, 
there's, um, there's thin provisioning, there's encryption, all these things LVM does. The one thing that LVM doesn't do is have a programmatic interface. Early on, the LVM uh, engineers made a decision that pretty much the command line was gonna be the way that you talked to LVM, which is great if you're a sysadmin, you're configuring LVM at the command line, you're familiar with the command line. If you're, if you're a program, this is less optimal. You have to build a command line, you have to send it, you have to shell out and send it to LVM, and then you have to parse the responses. So that's pretty unpleasant. So what that has meant is that every application that wants to configure LVM kind of has a wrapper, a programmatic wrapper that they've developed around that command line interface that really does what they want, what they want and lets the rest of their program use the LVM in a programmatic way. So um, that may have, that LVM decision to kind of just say the command line is the only way to do things, that made things easier in the beginning, but as time has gone on, as automation has become more important, I think that that's become a more and more painful decision for the rest of us. So I'm one of those people. I had to, I was trying to write some related block device code and wanted to use LVM and was frustrated by the fact that LVM didn't have an API. And one possible solution to this that was a little out of the box was, came, came to be by looking at the way that LVM works. LVM, all the different LVM commands like PV change or LVV create or, you know, there's about 30 or 40 of them. They all resolve down to a single binary. And there's no daemon or anything necessarily running that, um, that, these, that these commands are talking to, no centralized location. What happens is that each instance of the, pro, of the LVM program being run makes sure that they don't conflict with other possible instances of the same program being run in a different window or from a different machine or a different user by using file locking, the flock, the flock uh, system call. So what I thought was, okay, I could write another program, and that program would use the same file locking to make sure that it didn't step on LVM's toes and LVM wouldn't step on its toes, and I could, this new program could manipulate the metadata. This new program could manipulate device mapper to do whatever it had to do. Instead of a command line interface, it would have an API, a programmatic API, it would leave the command line processing to, to the command line tools. It would just provide a Dbus API, which, and Dbus being kind of like the, the uh, it's a non-language specific kind of lingua franca of the Linux systems world, at least these days. Whatever language you chose to wrote Melvin in, you could still write a Dbus client that talked to Melvin and manipulated uh, LVM in a programmatic way using the Dbus API. So, so that's what Melvin is. And I, Melvin got to the point where it could read and write the metadata, it could control device mapper. Um, I actually implemented the flock system call in Rust just so that it could do this coordination. But, and it actually, so if you, had cre if you created a logical volume in Melvin, LVM, was like, oh, yes, that's a logical volume, I know what that is. So, I mean, there was, there was compatibility between the two, at least at a, at a basic starter level. But it was not to be. LVM is really, 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 really important. And this was thinking out of the box, and I think maybe it was thinking a little bit too far out of the box for what was uh, something that Maybe customers would accept. Certainly the LVM team was like, what? So it's mission critical. And LVM, it expects other instances of itself to take those locks and interact with those data structures. But it wasn't designed, it wasn't a public API. The, the metadata structure is documented in a, in a kind of general FYI kind of way, but it's not, it's, that's not, that's not an API. The, 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 flock, the locking mechanism is not a public API, so it's a little, it's a little dicey what, we were, what uh, I was trying to do. 
and um, it proved to, to not really be viable. The final thing that they mentioned was that Rust as an implementation language is great, um, but it's still early days for Rust. There is progress being made to get it into the Rust toolchain to get it into Debian. There's bugs open to get it into other distros, but it hasn't necessarily happened yet. And that's just like the rolling distros. Once you talk about enterprise distros, then it would be some, some period after that before the Rust toolchain is going, is re, it's realistic to think that the Rust toolchain will be in those. Debian unstable. Debian unstable, okay. So I know a lot more about LVM now. Uh, I grepped through the LVM code a whole lot, found a couple bugs. I know a whole lot more about Rust. This was actually the second Rust project uh, that I tackled, but boy, I got into stuff that I did not know before. And I also learned a lot more about Device Mapper, and we'll be talking more about Device Mapper. But this is the, this is the thing that LVM uses that's in the kernel to actually make the new devices that have these special powers or whatever. It's pretty cool. I really like Device Mapper. So, got shut down, walking the dog, thinking about Device Mapper. What could we do with Device Mapper? One good thing about LVM exposing pretty much all the Device Mapper functionality to, um, to be used by people is that it's covering all the bases. So that means that maybe something else could come along. Maybe it's more specialized. It doesn't, and it doesn't have to tackle everything that LVM is doing. It could just do something that's more fo focused. So that's like, OK, what about some sort of more dynamic use of the device mapper to, to give us a, a friendlier way to store our data? LVM does everything. It's, you can go super deep with it. Maybe let's go the other way. So that's where, so this is the idea for Froyo. You have, and this, if any of you are familiar with Drobo, the Drobo product, this is kind of, draws inspiration from that. So you have some number of disks laying around. They're not the same size. Um, you just give them all to something and then from that something comes a file system that does everything and your data is safe and it never runs out of space and you don't have to worry about tweaking parameters. If something goes wrong, it handles it, that kind of thing. So Froyo. Drobo plus free plus YOLO is Froyo. <laughs> so if you're going to give all your data to some magical piece of software, Part of the promise of that software is that it's your, your, your data is going to stay there. This is, uh, this is uh, you, want it, you, want it to be, <laughs> you want it to be there long term and it can't lose it. The other part of it, of course, is uh, something that RAID can't do, something that ZFS can't do, is to use multiple, any, any size disk that you give to it to use it to its fullest capacity. And also, in addition to that, to be able to adapt to a drive failure, a drive being removed, and also adapt to more drives being added or larger drives being added. Froyo wants to do, wants to be as simple as possible to use. So, do there, just so far, just like thinking about the options that there are in configuring things. Does the user really have to know We've already, we're already not telling them anything about the way that their, their data is actually stored on the disks. Are there options that they really need to set? Maybe, maybe a couple, but really we want to avoid them as much as, poss as possible. We're also further limiting the scope by saying this isn't a boot drive. This isn't even a system drive. This is, this is the place where you put your pictures. This is the place where you put your videos that you absolutely do not want to lose because it has pictures of your kid on it but it's, and you want it to, you want to be able to lose a disk, but it's not, it's not 
you know, maybe, you, maybe it's always connected to your system, maybe you connect it, put stuff on it, and then you put it in a closet or something. Maybe it's an archive, that kind of thing. The last thing is that we want to do as little work as possible. We have a great tool in the device mapper subsystem. We have a, a super solid file system in XFS. Let's leverage those systems to do as much as possible so Froyo is not actually moving data. Froyo is, is orchestrating where the data is put, but it's not actually moving the data. We can rely on XFS or we can rely on device mapper for those capabilities. So just like, just like Melvo, Mel, excuse me, Melvin, Froyo is written in Rust. I really think that Rust is a great systems programming language for all these reasons. There are some, there's some code that I'm responsible for that has to be in, in C, and for all these reasons, Rust is better. You don't have to worry about um, having a garbage collector or doing reference counting in most cases. You don't have to worry about many aspects of security that you would, would as a C programmer, you're like, do I want to use stern copy, or, and then you've got to figure out the length and all that stuff. Don't have to worry about any of that. It, Rust does high level programming with iterators and, and, um, and functions and all that thing really well. It also does low level. So in addition to Froyo, um, one thing that came out of Melvin and that Froyo uses is that we pulled out uh, the device mapper specific code into a library. So it's doing the grotty work of dealing with the device mapper ioctals and letting Froyo handle all the high level thinking about where the storage needs to be. And it's got, in addition to that, it's thread safe. And probably the most, well, I don't know if it's underappreciated. I feel like it could be appreciated more is uh, the Rust package manager cargo, which for a C developer, or even for a Python developer, it's really a revelation. It takes a lot of things that were pain points even with a package manager and gets rid of them and makes it really easy to incorporate code that's been uh, um, made into libraries by other developers. For de de device mapper, specifically Froyo right now uses those uh, DM targets. We want to use XFS, like I said before. And the last thing is the Dbus API. I think this is really important, not just for the reasons that were important in Melvin, but specifically for Froyo. So for, if we talk about Dr uh, the Drobo disk array, it was a box that you put disks in, but it had lights on it, so you could see which disk was active, and it, it would indicate um, the status of the overall array with those lights. It had a, a set of lights that indicated uh, how full it was. The third thing is that you could know what disks were being used by Drobo because the, they were actually inserted into the, into the hardware device. So if we're doing everything in software, that's not something that we're going to have. Uh, with Froyo, I mean, maybe you have um, a couple disks in the system, in a, an enclosure, but then maybe you have um, a single other disk by itself off in its own enclosure. And Froyo needs to uh, handle that situation. But that means that we don't have that hardware solution to lean on. We need to make the, it easier to write software notifications for is, is the device getting full? Um, is the device in a critical state? And I think Dbus is the way to do that at, th at this point. Finally, it's important for the command line tool to be a consumer of that API. So we're eating our own dog food and making sure that it's rich enough for, other, for, um, for anybody to use it in, in its full capacity. So let's look at a specific example of what Froyo might do with, if it was given four disks of differing capacities. So this is, it just basically makes multiple RAID devices that maximize the amount of space that can be used across the, across the disks. So we're going to lose the capacity of the largest disk because uh, the RAID is going to need that for its redundancy information. So we really, the capacity of this is going to be five terabytes, one plus two plus two, and the three terabytes is going to be unused. And in addition, we can't make use of this little bit at the bottom because we don't have another disk 
that we can establish re redundancy on for, the, for those uh, disk blocks. So then imagine those two RAID device targets that we just created on the last slide, and then on top of them, we're going to build using more device mapper targets. We're going to have a linear target that's going to use blocks from both RAID devices to, um, to create a data device and a metadata device that then become a thin pool uh, DM, DM device. Then from that thin pool, we can create thin volumes, and these thin volumes are, this gives us a, a copy on write functionality. So the file system on top, the XFS file system on top, uses disk blocks. Those are taken from the data device, but the XFS file system could potentially be much larger than the actual disk blocks that are being used, and therefore the data device will be uh, typically much smaller. Although, if you do fill up the XFS file system, then that's an additional thing that you have to worry about with thin provisioning. So looking at that previous example, what happens now if the drive fails? If a drive fails. So the one terabyte disk is bad. That means that one of our RAID devices is no longer no longer has redundancy, it's degraded. So, although the DM RAID 2 is still, is still there. So we have, we have two choices. We, the promise of Froyo is that it keeps your data safe, so we have to do something. We can't just leave it degraded, that's just like, that's, that's not gonna be sufficient. If you lose another drive, you're gonna lose all your data. So we need to somehow fix this. One, the first option is that if you're not actually using all the blocks that would, if you're not actually using all of the data that uh, is supported by the, the Froyo device, you can actually reshape smaller. And this is possible because we know we know that XFS is only using, all of the XFS data is in the thin pool, and the thin pool it consists of these two other devices, and these two other devices aren't actually using the full capacity of DM RAID 1 and DM RAID 2. So what we can do is, so DM RAID 1 is the one that's no longer redundant. If we just copy the two sections that are on DM RAID 1 now, and we move them over onto DM RAID 2, then we can blow away DM RAID 1, DM RAID 2 is redundant, and we've maintained our, our redundancy of the, of, of the uh, file system that sits on top. Another option is if the user, yes, question? Is that information you get from XFS? Like, how do you know where those spikes are? So XFS is using We've told XFS that it can use a huge number of blocks. It's not necessarily going to use all those blocks, but whatever blocks it does use, we are going to back by storage in this data device. So as XFS uses more and more blocks, we're going to have to increase the size of the data device. So you, you can track that as it starts to write in the new blocks or something? Right. So uh, there's a certain amount of blocks that are going to be free in the data device. When those start getting low, then we're going to get a notification from Device Mapper, and we'll either, uh -huh. e either be able to extend that, or if the data of device at that point actually fills up the entire thing, then we're out of luck, and we need, we need to do something else, and we wouldn't be able to reshape smaller. Yeah. Yeah, right there. So, um, does discard work so that pass through correctly? If you do a delete, then it will... Right, so if you create a huge file on the XFS file system, and then you delete it, then you would need to turn on XFS built-in discard, or you would need to run the FS trim utility. And what that does is that that's, that's how the thin pool device knows, okay, these blocks are no longer being used. I can reuse those. Okay. So then if we have, so moving on with the second example, if we did actually have, if our imagined user did have another three terabyte hard drive sitting on their shelf, 
they could tell Froyo, all right, that one, we're taking out the one terabyte. We're putting in the new disk. We're, we're going to give it to you, Froyo, to, to manage. And that means that DM RAID 1 can, can reestablish its redundancy by, uh, by uh, doing its thing on the first part of, of the new three terabyte hard drive. It also means that DM RAID 2 can reshape itself to instead of being on three disks, to being on four disks. So that's going to give us, that's going to make DM RAID 2 have more blocks that are accessible for future, for future use by the, uh, the file system on top. Finally, we previously had some unused space on the largest disk. Now it, there is a, there is a, a pair that of, there is another disk with free space on it. We can create uh, a RAID 1 mirror of that and thereby get, uh, make use of that space as well now. So you could do all of this with LVM. You could have multiple size disks. You could create multiple RAID devices. You could create the thin pool on top of the multiple RAID devices. Um, and you, know, you could build the stack yourself. But that's what we don't want the user to have to do. LVM is a powerful tool for um, maximizing the capabilities. But that requires that the person driving LVM have a lot of experience. And maybe we have experience when we set it up, but then it's a couple years later and the disk fails and we just don't want to worry about it. This is something that can just take care of that for us and, and help, us, help those of us who don't use LVM every day. Question. Um, maybe you can explain, how are you tweaking TLER? So, okay, the question is how are you tweaking TLER. TLER is, the, is a drive parameter that instead of trying really hard to read a disk that, excuse me, read a sector on the disk that's marginal, it just kind of gives up after a while because, um, well, if you're in a RAID set, it's just quicker to get from one of the other disks rather than trying really hard if it's not the only copy. So the idea with Froyo is that there is that Damon, there is that monitor there the whole time, and the creation of the the configuration of the individual disks in the Froyo set are are controlled by Froyo, and it, it's just okay. I'm adding a new disk. I know that all the storage on it is going to be in a, in a going to be redundant, so just set the TLER using. Okay. I read a blog post that said that there was some other tool that could do it. So this was this is something that hasn't been done but could be done, I think. If it's possible to do, then Froyo can do it. Exactly. If it's not possible to do, then Froyo can't do it. So there are other file systems that kind of incorporate the volume management into them, uh, specifically ZFS and, and ButterFS. So when it comes to ZFS, I actually looked at ZFS as like something that maybe, hey, can I do device mapper based ZFS? ZFS is actually less configurable in terms of various drive configurations than, the, than Drobo or Froyo because it's targeted, and that's, it made that choice because it's targeted at an enterprise market. What it demands is that you can have multiple uh, it can be composed of multiple pieces, but each of these pieces has to itself be redundant in itself, but then you can combine them. So if you have an individual drive fail over here, then it's just basically a RAID set, at least from a drive re uh, replacement perspective. And of course, the other issue with ZFS and, and ZFS on Linux is the licensing thing, which is really disappointing to a lot of people, but that's the way it is right now. When it comes to ButterFS, I think ButterFS has the, the promise one of the promises that it makes, one of the, the capabilities that it claims is that this is something that could potentially be done by ButterFS. Um, so to that I would say um, it's always good to have alternatives in the open source world. This is a completely different approach. Um, so I, I still think this is an avenue worth, worth exploring uh, even, even with the existence of ButterFS. 
So the current status of Froyo is that uh, the superblock, the metadata formats are in place. Froyo can create all the layers that I was showing you before. It can create the, the, the RAID slice, the, the, RAID, the multiple RAID um, volumes, thin pool, create the XFS. A Froyo can, a device can work in degraded mode. Various things extend the way that uh, you'd want them to. The Dbus server part has been implemented yet, has been documented and implemented. The part where I was talking before about um, Froyo using Dbus to kind of talk to it, the Froyo command line tool using Dbus to talk to the, the server component, that's not there yet. That's, that's um, something I'll definitely want to be working on in the near future. Uh, other things that are, I'd like to work on in the, in the very near future that are missing right now is that monitoring aspect. Um, getting the events from, uh, from the various devices when things fill up and auto expanding, um, you know, seeing, when that, seeing when one of those RAID volumes fails and then alerting, alerting the user over DBUS or whatever. All that stuff is, is uh, not there yet, and I really want it to be there really soon. The other and probably the most challenging algorithmically and computational part of Froyo is just the whole the reshape thing that I was talking about. Um, reshaping bigger isn't really that hard. Um, you know, you've got, in that example before, um, you want to be able to have that three-legged RAID volume and expand it to four legs. Um, that's actually something that, some, that uh, uh, is being worked on right now. It's not in the upstream kernel yet, but that's something that we could take advantage of. Um, but it's also the being able to reshape smaller and figuring out when, when you can reshape and when you can't reshape. Um, I think that's, that's, that's a really interesting, and, and how you make that happen, the series of steps that you take with moving data, creating intermediate L, um, LVM, uh, excuse me, device mapper devices to move data around to kind of orchestrate that happening, I think is really interesting. And the cool thing is that it's not a cliff that has to be climbed, it's a series of milestones. First you get uh, reshape larger working, then you get the easy cases of reshape smaller working, and then you can tackle the ones, the more difficult cases. The shorter to, short to medium term plans are to get some testers, get some contributors, which is challenging, because uh, it is written in Rust, so I'm hoping that um, the pool of people who are interested in working on Rust and also interested in solving this problem, there will be, those two sets will not be entirely disjoint. There will be some people who are interested in that. Um, I would like to get it to the point where I can use this for my cache of data that I want to always be safe. And then finally, I want to be able to, to sell my Drobo. So in conclusion, programmatic APIs are good. Device mapper is cool. I think it gets, the way it gets used right now just by LVM, I don't think that takes full advantage of the kind of active um, changes and manipulations that, that, that the, the in-kernel device mapper module is capable of and that we're trying to take advantage of in Froyo. Um, this is the kind of the first time that I've been talking about Froyo, so your feedback on this talk about the concepts behind Froyo would really like to Get, get your feedback on those. And I think that Froyo can be good, and maybe, maybe with your help. So that's it. We've got uh, an IRC channel. We've got the repo. And uh, hopefully, we'll have a, an email list shortly. Um, but that'll be documented on the GitHub repo. Questions? Okay, that one. So in this case, we have the VMRate 1 and VMRate 2, but they're on the same drive. So could you like squash them together? Yes, you could, but you would have to. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. The question was so we have DMRAID 1 and DMRAID 2, which at this point actually have the same set of drives that make them up. So could you at this point combine them? Yes, you could. So. One, one thing I've been 
kind of mulling over is how many, does it make sense to do that? Or does it make sense to actually go the other way and instead of having one DM, one DM raid for kind of fill the maximum amount of space for the, how the, the drives that it can use, maybe, I mean, things get, things really change because it's not a user having to set this stuff up anymore, it's a computer program. So having one DM raid is just as easy as having 10 raids that, that fill that. You know, maybe, maybe that might be something that you want to do. But every, having things be done by the computer instead of having it done, being done by the user opens up a lot of, because you just have to figure the algorithm out once. You don't have to do it each time something goes wrong. You have to figure out what you have to do. So. I think there's a lot of promise for, for different things that you could do. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> the question was, what do I think the, uh, the multiple layers of the device mapper stack, what impact will that have on performance? And the answer is I don't know. Maybe that's an encryption. It would probably, I mean, it's, none of these are terribly, he's, uh, the gentleman said it might be less than encryption. I don't think it would be that much, but I would also say that, of, you know, kind of the design goals for Froyo, performance wasn't necessarily one of them. So, and I would also say that Device Mapper gives us other tools that might, if performance is important, that Instead of worrying about that, you just add the capability to use some kind of caching device to Froyo, and that that would, give you, that would be the way to get performance rather than optimizing the, the base mass storage to, to performance necessarily. It's really about the flexibility and the performance. We're really, that's another kind of difference between the, um, the Drobo device and the Froyo, and Froyo, is that we're using the host processor, we're using um, disks that the host processor can see. Um, one problem that a lot of people had with the Drobo is that you, it showed you one disk and kind of did all of these things, had the multiple disks behind there, and so you were using that CP, the CPU on the device rather than the CPU, rather than the host CPU, and the host CPU is always going to be more powerful in the long run. So that gives us more options. Oh. In the front, and then. Oh, I just want to have you considered state use in any way? For, the question is, I don't didn't understand how hard it was. Okay, uh, <laughs> have we considered dedupe? That would be again, we're relying on Device Mapper and XFS for pretty much all the capabilities that Froyo is providing. So if uh, the DM thin target gained the ability to do device to do dedupe, then that would be something that we would want to we would we would use that capability, turn that on, to to achieve that. Yeah. What RAID format can you use? Can't you use? Will things default to? I mean, in this model, are you RAID five, RAID five, RAID one? Okay, the question is, what RAID format does Froyo use by default? So one interesting thing is that you can actually use RAID 5 on two disks, and it'll give you a mirror. So just using RAID 5 for everything at this point. Now, it would make sense, I mean, if, uh, so the minimum disks right now are two, and the maximum disks are eight. I think if you used, well really, even seven or eight, it gets a little, a little dicey and maybe you want to have six, six is where you want to stop. Right. Well, that's the thing, if you, if you could remodel as you scale, right. then you might say, well, this target now needs to be raised six, I want two spares, or, right. okay. I'm not sure how, do we want to, now start adding erasure coding into device mapper to deal with larger hard drive sets. Right, whether, you, whether yeah. So you could do that or you could just, you don't, I mean this example, every, 
every DM rate is using the maximum number of disks that it, that it can to because that maximizes the um, that minimizes the overhead of being redundant. But that doesn't. I mean, if you had ten disks, you could do Froyo could just do use five have two different RAID devices on each of those five. Okay. Right. Any, uh, right. And because this whole thing about is taking all those multiple RAID devices and then gluing them together and then putting the stuff on top so it should all just kind of, if they're like this or if they're like this, Froyo shouldn't care. I, I, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, back there. I have a very simple question. Does Rock Smart only If you had done three, three, and then one, and, and, yeah. and these two? That's a great point. That's, yeah, so. That's not something that Froyo does right now, but that sounds, th okay, the question was, are there different ways, rather than kind of this greedy, algorithm for making RAID devices. Could you use a less greedy algorithm, but then that would give you better, better redundancy? And do, do you want to, uh, in, ensuring, ensuring the probabilities against drive failures across all the drives? Um, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, that's not something that it does right now, but that would, if it increases the reliability, then that, that would be, that's an algorithm that would probably be be a good thing to do. Um, do you have any particular, like any uh, preferences or reasoning uh, behind what the, the amount of redundancy that you want? Because um, I'm, I'm looking at this and I, I've been thinking about like what is the biggest advantage and the best, and essentially it's the one more best installation that basically allowed you to plug um, lots of uh, uh, you know, new disks in, uh, however, and only one would be. Right. So your question is, why don't you do something like Ceph? Well, more, there's a difference between a mirror and RAID 5. Right. RAID 6 and, and so on. The, the level of redundancy, but the, the, the Ceph approach of, you know, um, I have data, I want to duplicate it, and now it's potentially more duplicates to get achieve that redundancy and then prevent that. Okay, so the user specifies the redundancy parameters and then the, the, the subsystem kind of figures it out is, yeah. is kind of the goal. Yeah, I, I, when I was listening to the Ceph talk, I was like, Froyo is like Ceph, but on a single system. I think there's a, there was like, a, I was like, there was like alarm bells going off in my head listening to, to, to that. So yeah, there's a lot of, so that's like Ceph is across clusters, but this is like each disk rather than the cluster. Uh, the question was, uh, it's a resource allocation. Would uh, would a solver make sense to to do this? Yeah, and I think that's. I mean, being being smart about the way that you lay out the disk, that's that's kind of that's a, a, a virtue I think that that Froyo would really would really help with. You have a high level language that lets you be uh, implement a complicated algorithm, and you also have your you're not, you're specifically abstracting the storage from the user so the user doesn't have, to not make the user have to worry about that. So, yeah, and for that. Um, last question. Well, essentially, uh, if we were just thinking the same thing about Ceph, whether we could do single node Ceph to solve the problem in a, in a different way. So, if anyone wants to discuss that, I'll be there. Um, does this why not a safer story make more default operators? Are you there? 
All right. Thank you.